loved every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Good afternoon and welcome to the NAACP Forum. You already know, we are Broxton's Choice for Civil Rights News. We have a very, very exciting person sitting with me today, District Attorney candidate, the Democratic candidate for District Attorney, John Bradley. Welcome to the NAACP Forum. How are you? Very good, thank you. And uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to be on and, and talking about such important issues during the campaign season. Absolutely. So I. You know, I tell people that when you're having a conversation with the bishop, it's just like having a conversation in my living room. Clearly, I have notes, but I typically go off the cuff to ask some specific questions that are important to the constituents, not only of the NAACP, but of the city of Brockton, and hopefully those that could be watching it on YouTube uh, throughout Plymouth County. So this is the big question. Mm -hmm. Big question. You ready? I'm ready. Why are you trying to fire your ex-boss? Tell <laughs> us. Tell the community. Well, that's uh, that's a good question to lead with because, as uh, having done your homework, as you know, <laughs> I have. Bishop Branch, I worked in the office for a long time. I worked. Yep. Uh, I started my legal career there back in 1991. Way back then. Oh, a long time. A long time ago. Yep. And uh, I worked under three different DAs in the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office. And I have to tell you that in the 90s. Uh, we had a superb office. I, I think many people would tell you that it was the best district attorney's office in the entire state. Wow. And after a brief um, tenure at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston, after our country was attacked on September 11, 2001, I came back to the district attorney's office under okay. the incumbent, who I had known for then 12 years, and I expected that he would do a tremendous job. Let me just interrupt you. When you say you, you knew him personally and professionally? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes. And, you know, for a while the office ran, ran pretty well under, under the incumbent District mm -hmm. Attorney Cruz. But after a period of time, things really started to go downhill. Oh. Uh, hard to pinpoint exactly when that happened, but I would say around 2009 or so is when um, I, I think it started rapidly decelerating. And... Since then, it, it has really um, continued to go downhill. It has been described as the worst district attorney's office in the entire state. So that, that's a harsh indictment. For the viewers, define going downhill. What does that mean to, to a layperson? Well, I got fired in 2012 by the incumbent, and I was fired, I, I believe then and still believe now, because I stopped writing him campaign contribution checks, which is something that he expected his employees to do. Mm. And that was a form of silent protest on my part. I stopped writing him checks because he was engaging in deals with high-level criminals here in Brockton, um, reducing their charges, reducing their sentences, and essentially allowing them to run amok in this city because they promised to cooperate on the other end and provide information in homicide cases. And I knew that was a very dangerous practice. And so, um, sure enough, um, things got bad. Uh, we had some of these cooperators shooting at people and missing. They were out there dealing drugs. But then, um, sadly, after I was fired, uh, a young man named Joshua LeClaire was, was killed uh, by a man named Lionel Brown Madison who had had his minimum mandatory gun case reduced by the district attorney because Brown Madison had promised to cooperate. And, uh, but for that decision to knock down his minimum mandatory gun charge, mm -hmm. Joshua LeClaire would be alive today. And that's what I had predicted would happen mm -hmm. eventually. And uh, I'm sad to say, as I sit here today, that it did happen. So, Counselor, when you say, so I really am not going to be going by notes today. So when you say that, um, you want, kind of warned someone. Who did you warn? 
And what was your role in the district attorney with respect to this particular uh, decision? I was the deputy first assistant district attorney. And so did you oppose this decision on the record? Yes. Oh, yes. It was a practice. Wow. And, and that was the, the big part of the problem. This yes, wasn't sir. an isolated incident. This was a pattern of activity that was going on within the office. And I wasn't a lone wolf in speaking out against it. Virtually every experienced prosecutor in the office had a major problem with this. And because I was a senior person, I was elected to speak to Mike Coran, who was the chief legal counsel at the time, mm -hmm. and the district attorney directly, which I did repeatedly. And our concerns, unfortunately, fell on deaf ears. So the, the district attorney, just for our audience, the district attorney is the chief law enforcement officer for our county. In fact, in, within the Commonwealth, the district attorney is known as the most powerful individual in the justice system here. You're telling me, based upon what you just said, that our district attorney was actually light on crime. Is, is, that, is, is that your assessment? He was selectively light on crime. He, what does that mean, selectively light? He, purported, he, he purports, he claims to be a hardcore, law and order, Republican district attorney yes, with a no plea bargaining policy. Tough on crime. But the fact of the matter is, he does plea bargain selectively, and he did plea bargain with these very, very dangerous cooperating witnesses. And as I said, he, in my view, wasted taxpayer money by putting them up in, in apartments, uh, by paying for things like cell phones and meals, essentially coddled them while they were allowed to commit serious crimes in this city when they should have been in jail. So let me just ask you, I'm not sure specifically about what deals they, well, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but are you saying that District Attorney Cruz, on the other side of this, did not benefit by, like, did he get additional criminals convicted, anything like that? I mean, were there confidential informants? Did he, I mean, were they, were they able to help the DA and the Brockton police with a sweep of some of the crime? We, we as citizens did not benefit from those actions by the district attorney. You know, Is that what you're saying? Bishop Branch, that's a good question. And there may have been some benefits mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that he could better describe to you, but to me, the end does not justify the means. Gotcha. My rule as an experienced prosecutor, and I'm a career prosecutor who's done 30-plus murder cases, is when you're dealing with a dangerous person who claims to have all this information and is willing to bargain with you, you have to employ the Hippocratic Oath. Your rule one has to be do no harm. Right. So you can't unleash dangerous criminals on the community here in Brockton simply because they might give you a reward at the other end. So your, your, candidacy, your candidacy for, for district attorney, are you saying that you would be tough on crime? And if you're saying that, how would, what would you do differently than Timothy Cruz? I would be much smarter on crime. Ooh, define that because I would use my experience uh, as someone who's done things at the highest levels in the trenches. Yes, sir. Where he makes decisions, I believe, based on political expediency, what he thinks is gonna play in the media, and that isn't the right way to do the job. As a district attorney properly doing his or her job, you have to balance two things. You have to keep your community safe, while at the same time, serving as a gatekeeper of the criminal justice system and as a minister of justice. So those are your two mission statements as a district attorney properly doing the job. And that's how I would do it. We have statistics nationally and within the Commonwealth, whereas if we continue the trend, especially around uh, minimal sentences, every one in three African-Americans or even incorporating brown, black and brown will be incorporated Although Massachusetts is known to have one of the lowest incarceration rates across, the, across America, uh, what, did, what is your position on the recently signed a criminal justice reform? I think, and I say this again, in all my experience, it's, it's past time that we started getting serious about criminal justice reform. We should have known a long time ago that not only does mass incarceration not work, it is very much discriminatory and it affects people Wait a minute, of color. I, let, me, let me be clear on this. Am I hearing you say, I just heard Elizabeth Warren say two weeks ago, maybe two and a half weeks ago, that the uh, criminal justice system is racist. 
Is John Bradley saying that this is a racist system? You Are know, you going I, that far? I think, and I'm not sure what she meant by that exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know she was. But you said discriminatory, though. Discriminatory. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly not everybody who is involved in the system is racist or intends to be discriminatory. Gotcha. What I'm saying is there are, or ha and have been for a long time, mm -hmm. certain practices and policies that have been kind of baked into the system that are very much discriminatory. Give racist. us an example of one of those baked in policies. Well, if you look back at the crack cocaine epidemic, oh. <laughs> and that's when I started in 1991, mm -hmm. crack cocaine was the drug out there in our communities, mainly in urban communities. Mm -hmm. And see, that was the thing. In the federal system, if the crack, the imbalance in sentencing between being caught with crack cocaine and powdered cocaine was off the charts. And of course, crack cocaine being an urban drug, it affected people of color that much more. Right. Powdered cocaine was then and still is now more of a recreational drug. Right. And so you had many, many African Americans who were sent to federal prison uh, during the crack boom for these off the chart sentences. I mean, 20 years here, 30 years there. Whereas white people who were caught with powdered cocaine, their drug of choice, were doing far less time. I mean, the, the disproportion was incredible. And that's a good example of it. So with your, with, if you get elected as district attorney, you know, there's a large, there's a huge conversation, excuse me, not large, huge conversation in, with the Boston race, where one individual says that she's probably not going to even prosecute a lot of misdemeanors. What is your position on some of these low level criminal complaints that come by way of the clerk magistrate or an arrest. What's, I know it's a balancing act. It counselor. is, it so is. So tell, tell, tell the audience, what, what, are, what are your thoughts around these low level, level crimes? One of my grievances against the system and, and the way things have played out over the past mm -hmm. 10, 15 years particularly is that I think we've lost sight of the human factor in the criminal justice system. We're not prosecuting widgets. You but know, I, I could hear, respectfully, I could hear people in other parts of, of Plymouth County saying, lock them up. Why, what's the necessity of being human about it? Because if we lock too many people up, as we have been, where has it gotten us? Right. Where has it gotten us? If anything, I think there's an argument to be made that we're keeping our communities less safe. The problem is I see, or hmm. one of the problems is, the collateral consequences of being charged with a crime Absolute, these days right, I have that, yeah. are right. just far more than they ever have been. So when someone gets arrested even, let alone locked up, it has an effect of upending that individual's life. You could lose your job, you could lose your apartment, you could become estranged from your family, you could develop physical and mental health issues mm -hmm. as, as a result of all this. Mm -hmm. And the system as it now stands too much in my view is is almost built to have people come back into the system once they get out of it instead of being able to focus on rehabilitation because we stack the deck so high particularly for low-level offenders mm -hmm. uh, to return to a normal life and become good citizens and we have to take a serious look at what we're doing and try to change that so when you look at one of the things that has come come out is that uh, once a person, a person is convicted and they're in the system, how do we deal with recidivism? Do you have a plan for that? Uh, do you have, uh, I know you probably have, a, I guess so I'll ask the, uh, a question before that. What are you going to do with those people that are stealing because they're addicted to drugs? Literally, that's why they're doing it. They're not criminals, but they're trying to feed their right. addiction. What's your, what's your uh, we have, position on that? We should have learned by now. But we Certainly. haven't. <laughs> That locking up addicts right. doesn't do any good. Right. So what do we do? What do we do that's differently? My my overarching idea is that we have to involve the medical community more because the legal system is simply not equipped to deal with the problem. Of so addiction. you believe in drug courts? I do. Okay. Absolutely. I believe in diverting uh, adult first-time drug offenders and trying to get them the help they need. I think we need to focus on getting doctors involved more, relying on scientific and medical research and data more than we have been in the past. 
because this bit of locking up addicts for committing low-level crimes and then hoping that they will be clean after they finish up their term of incarceration is ridiculous. So, so Counselor, you are, as you have stated, a career prosecutor. You haven't done defense work. That's right. Um, what is your, typically prosecutors want to say, no bail, no bail, no bail. What is your position on cash bail reform? Well, I think I was the first candidate or sitting district attorney to have the intestinal fortitude to come out and say that we need to get rid of cash bail in its entirety oh. because it is a broken system. We can keep our community safer while not locking people up because they are mired in poverty. And that is a win-win for everybody. Cash bail, you think, should go? It should go. Wow. And I have a system to put in its place. Okay. All right. Tell me a little bit about um, the expungement of records for those that have marijuana convictions. Are you opposed to that? No. I mean, that's a part of the criminal justice reform, but these folks will need hearings. Governor Baker has actually um, filed new legislation to clean up the, the law that was recently signed, which includes that the public needs to know, uh, needs to know about these expungements or give the public an opportunity to weigh in. Are you supporting that type of language? Or should, if, since the law, since marijuana is here now, legally, should these expungements just be a part of someone filing their application with the Department of Probation? It comes then, I guess, I'm not sure if a judge still signs them. That was the old model. A judge signs them. But you could, the district attorney's office could oppose these expungements. W what's your take on expungement? Well, I think expungement for low-level offenses is an excellent idea. You do? I do, because as I said... So well, you're, you're a different type of prosecutor. I, just, well, I mean, when people are going to hear this, you really are. I am. I am. But my, my views are, ex are informed by my experience. As I said, it makes a difference when you've been in the trenches and have convicted many, many people of murder and sent them away for life in prison. We need to focus on violent crime, serious crime, and lock those people up to keep our community safe. On the other end of the spectrum, at the lower levels, mm -hmm. we need to take a much smarter approach to what we're doing because locking people up at the lower levels not only isn't working, mm -hmm. it's costing you and I and everybody else that's watching out there a lot of money that we could put to much better uses. Counselor, are the gun laws working? You know, we have, the, tough, we have the, the toughest gun laws in the country, yet we have multiple shootings in right. Brockton. What's going on? So you, you, the short answer to that is they're, they're not working nearly as well as they should have. And that, that kind of segues into one of my main policy issues, which is Talk about it. targeting illegal, illegally possessed guns. Now, every time there's a mass shooting in this country, we go through kind of a wash, rinse, repeat cycle. Yes, we do. Yes. We're outraged for a brief period of time. Uh, there are protests. Um, you know, we talk about it for a few days, and then it simply dies out. It fizzles out. But what's been underrated and underserved is the issue of the shootings, the murders that go on in our communities every single day. Right. You know, and it particularly affects people of color. Yes, it does. In yeah. urban areas. Right. And my idea, very simply, is to focus on getting the illegally possessed guns off the street because it's never been a focus in the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office. They have a state police detective unit assigned to the office that has two components, a murder side and a drug side. And what I would do is I would take at least two detectives and have them focus on getting the guns out of our communities. Because if we do that, if we make it a focus, we will put a dent in the problem. We will take some of those guns off the streets. We will make it more difficult for particularly younger, younger people to go out and shoot each other, seriously hurting and killing each other, and we will keep our community safer. And we also have to find out where those guns are coming from that are making it into Plymouth County. Right. Where are people buying them and bringing them in, or where are they stealing them? Every gun should be traced through the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, because they do that. We just have to take advantage of it. And the more we learn, the more we know, the better equipped we can be to deal with the problem. Let me ask you, the, the issue, and I, I have to ask this question because it just 
the appropriate thing to do. This issue with the uh, state ballot commission around your address, where allegedly they they said, according to the Brock Enterprise, that you were mani manipulative and misleading, or you'd have that manner because you're a Boston native. You want to push back on that? Sure do. That's ridiculous. I don't know why they chose to include uh, that language. I know the chair of the state ballot commission is a diehard Republican. I know that um, Mr. Cruz was once a ma member of the state ballot commission, mm. but I was anything but deceptive. I moved into the county to run because I care about the office that much. I've seen how far the office has, go down, has gone downhill. Uh, I spent 20 of the best years of my professional career in that office, and I care enough to move into the county to try to win this election so that I can fix what's broken. And I was nothing but transparent. Unfair language? Uh, completely unfair. Let me ask you, um, you lose the election. If you lose the election, what's going to happen to John Bradley? That's an excellent question. Are you question. gone? Are we not going to see you again? I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, you know, I've been a public servant my entire career. I've been a prosecutor my entire career. And frankly, that's all I've ever wanted to do. Mm. Uh, I've loved my work over the years, and I hope to continue it. But... You know, I don't have a specific fallback if I lose. Obviously, I'll have to think of one. But, um, you know, it's a decision that I will not lightly enter into. Right now, of course, I just want to channel all my energies on trying to win this election. When you look at some of the uh, comments that are being made on the national level, specifically around what happened with the, the Kavanaugh hearings, are we doing a good job, or could the district attorney's office do a better job around these sort of uh, sexual abuse allegations similar to what the doctor, the professor had said before the U.S. Senate? Is that something that we should be concerned about within the current district attorney's office? I think so. Are we effectively uh, pursuing these cases? I think they could be pursued more effectively. I think that, uh, and this is more of a general issue maybe, yeah, okay. but the district attorney's office, uh, be beginning shortly after my termination, lost about 15 high-level talented prosecutors, and they have yet to replace that level of skill and experience. So I think if you looked at the statistics, you know, using kind of 2012, 2013 as a dividing point, yes. you will see that there have been many more not guilties, many more dismissed cases at the superior court level. The general competence level, the skill level has gone downhill. The experience level has gone downhill. And that's what I hope to restore. But more specifically, yes, I think we need to be much more energetic in terms of prosecuting this, these cases. We need to be smarter about them. We need to be not only sensitive to the rights of victims, but we need to make sure the system is properly dealing with these types of cases. When you left the Plymouth County office, where did you go to work? I eventually ended up in Worcester County. How would that DA describe your job performance? Boy, I don't know. That DA happens to be a friend of uh, Mr. Cruz. But so you're no longer there? I'm no longer there. No, okay. I'm a full-time candidate. So I continued to prosecute the most difficult cases at the highest levels, and I don't think there's anybody out there who could offer an unbiased opinion of my legal skills mm -hmm. that would not say I'm a good trial lawyer. That might have been a double negative, but uh, I, I think uh, my reputation in the legal community speaks for itself. So, John, we've kind of been negative do you have anything good to say about the district attorney? What would you say on a positive level? You know, that's, He's, is he a good guy? <laughs> you know, I, I thought he was until yeah. uh, in, until things went downhill for me. Right, but right. you know, when I was when I was fired, um, I was devastated. I I'm had put, sure, I'm put sure. my heart and soul into the job sure. for almost twenty years, and I have a, at the time my son was. Uh, two years old. Uh -huh. uh, I had a wife at home and that I was the main breadwinner in the family. Yes, so sir. it was devastating. And, you know, I sued him in federal court, as you know. Yes, sir, I'm aware. And uh, he went on to stick to taxpayers with $2.4 million in, in legal fees, despite offering at one point to pay everything. Uh, and that's outrageous. 
I mean, that's a testament to one's character. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very difficult for me to sit here and say something positive about him. So, um, so I, can't, I can't pull anything out of you. you. You really can't at this point. I, you know, I was once his friend. Right. And, uh, but what he did to me was just unconscionable. Okay, we're almost to the end. To tell the audience, again, why you're running for district attorney, give them your closing argument. Well, and it follows on the heels of what I just said. I want to underscore the fact that this isn't part of some revenge tour on my part. I decided to jump into this race in March only when I learned that nobody else was going to jump in. And I couldn't bear the thought of him having another four uncontested years to further run that office into the ground. And I want to restore professionalism to the office. I want to change the culture so that decisions are made based upon what the right thing to do is and not what's politically expedient. I'm going to bring all my experience to bear to restore strong leadership, install progressive ideals, some of which we've just discussed, and an ethical compass to an office that I believe sadly lacks those indispensable qualities. So I am going to keep our community safe by getting the guns off the streets, by prosecuting cases at high levels zealously and effectively, but I'm going to take a careful look at what's going on at the lower levels. I'm going to save the taxpayers money by not asking for cash bail on low-level offenders who do not deserve to be held on bail prior to any determination of guilt. That stands our time-honored cornerstone of innocent until proven guilty on its head. So if I could sum it up very briefly, Bishop sum Branch, yep. I'm going to be tough but fair and smart. And I'm going to be the type of district attorney that the people of this county deserve. Tough, fair, but smart. Listening to John Bradley running for district attorney, Plymouth County. Do you have any contact information you want to give our audience? I sure do. Please go to my website. You will see uh, in more detail some of the things I stand for. It's my name, John Bradley, the number 4DA.com. If you send me an email, I promise you I will return it. And if you get, want to get involved in this very, very important election to support my campaign, that's the best place to do it. We are the NAACP Forum introducing to you John Bradley, the Democratic, the Democratic candidate for District Attorney for Plymouth County. We're going to be also having the Republican uh, that's currently in the office, Tim Cruz, will be here on uh, October 24th. But until then, make sure, make sure you're registered to vote. The election is November 6th. We are the NAACP Forum. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till